Welcome to the Jungian Anthology Podcast, analytical psychology seminars from the archives of the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. Episode 18, Mythologies of Journey and Pilgrimage, with Thomas Patrick Lavin, Ph.D. This episode is part one of the series Myths to Grow By. In his later years, Joseph Campbell defined mythology as a system of energy-evoking and energy-directing symbols which serve four functions for individuals and for the culture, the mystical, the cosmological, the sociological, and developmental functions. This course addresses the personal development aspects of mythological systems, using the writings of Joseph Campbell and others as a guide. Seen in their developmental function, myths are blueprints or roadmaps to personal growth. To know our own personal myth is to be filled with energy and progressive visions of an attainable goal. To know the myths of a culture is to know the path out of the wasteland. Myths are daedalus wings, allowing us to fly out of the labyrinthine pain of our own narrowness. This course explores mythological images and patterns, as maps to personal and cultural development. It was recorded in 1995. Thomas Patrick Lavin, PhD, is a Zurich-trained Jungian analyst who holds a PhD in clinical psychology and a PhD in theology. He was formerly chief clinical psychologist for the U.S. Army and Europe and is a founding member of the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. He is in private practice in Wilmette, Illinois, and consults internationally on typology, spirituality, and addictions. If you are interested in continuing this series, the rest of it can be found on our website, www.jungchicago.org. And now here's the lecture. Welcome to all of you. I guess first you have to know that I, I really have a developmental sense of the work that I do in Jungian psychology, my work into and around the mysteries of humankind. So really what I'm sharing with you, I have to say, is my own current opinion, which I'm humbly offering for your own consideration and critical review. Uh, what I have to say about myths, my way of dancing around mystery is not the only way and it's not the best way. It just happens to be the best way that I've come up with at this particular time. Uh, and going through Joseph Campbell's work on mythology, uh, I don't know how many definitions I found of myth from different times in Campbell's career. There's a real development of his own understanding of myth. Um, As a matter of fact, he talks about the understanding of myth as a process. That generally the Western way of coming to terms with myth is sequential that uh, things that are more than normal dawn on us in the West. We don't have the myths, the stories of instant enlightenment that they have in the East. And so if you were to look at different stories, different myths of East and West, one big difference that you would see is that the Eastern approach to myth uh, contains a lot of stories about instantaneous enlightenment, instantaneous awareness of the, the fullness, the pleroma of the divine. Whereas we in the West tend to be more sequential. Uh, the divine comes to us a dawning rather than instantaneously. Um, and so there, there, 
I think is a growth in understanding in Campbell. Certainly there's a growth in understanding in Jung, and we're going to talk about this tonight too, about the the meaning of mythology. It widens and deepens, I think, in Jung's life, in Campbell's life, and I would uh, I would suggest in our lives. Second, uh, establishing that my way of dancing around mystery is not the only way. The second thing I want to say by way of introduction is that that I hope that what is said here and done here and experienced here in the next four weeks uh, as different will be an eventual source of harmony and respect for the life force for all of us. We're going to deal with differences. And sometimes people bring up differences in order to play one up. We're different, therefore better. And that certainly isn't, isn't the, the point. The differences we bring up should lead to a sense of harmony, both internally and externally. The difficulty is that if we don't understand a mythic dimension, and we're experiencing this in our country right now, if we don't experience a mythic dimension and container for difference, we become very afraid. And we want to take up arms. And we want to annihilate people who are different from us in any way or level. And and that, of course, is, is dangerous. So that in talking about differences, the goal is that there will be a source or it will lead to a source of harmony with and respect for the life force in all of us. Uh, That, I think, is, is really what Jungian psychology is about. How can I celebrate differences in you if I can't tolerate the differences in myself? And this is often a problem. I'm willing to tolerate differences in you only because I haven't learned yet to celebrate differences in myself. And so that is the sort of introductory remark that I want to make. We're going to talk about different ways of looking at internal and external reality. And maybe some things will be different from the way you look at things or were taught to look at things. And yet that difference and opening up to that difference is indeed, I think, the genius of the individuation process the ability to celebrate difference inside and outside. So, that I would like to do. Um, I'd like to to tell you a story. Uh, The story, and of course on myth, is probably well begun with a story. And this is a story about a woman who was in a coma and she was dying. And she suddenly had a feeling that she was taken up to heaven and stood before the judgment seat. Who are you, said the voice. I'm the wife of the mayor, she replied. I didn't ask you whose wife you are, but who you are. I'm the mother of four children. I didn't ask you whose mother you are, but who you are. I'm a school teacher. I did not ask what your profession is, but who you are. And so it went on. No matter what she replied, she did not seem to give a satisfactory answer to the question, who are you? I'm a Christian, she said. I did not ask you your religion, but who are you? I'm the one who went to church every day and always helped the poor and needy. 
I did not ask you what you did, but who you are. She evidently failed the examination and was sent back to Earth. When she recovered from her illness, she was determined to find out who she was. And that made all the difference. That's exactly what happened to Carl Gustav Jung on the 4th of April, 1944, when I was writing uh, tonight's lecture. I was, I'd never written those dates down. I knew the story from Jung's autobiography. Uh, but I wrote the date 4, 4, 44. And thought, oh my God. There's a little synchronistic something for you. Now, the story, by the way, is taken from a, a lovely book of stories by Anthony DeMello called Taking Flight. He has some wonderful stories in all of his books. But the, this one and another one are the last two compilation of stories from all different ages and traditions and, and so on. Um, what, I thought, what would I say if the same thing happened to me? Because I, I don't think I'd want to come back. <laughs> uh, if I was in a coma and dying, uh, and I wouldn't want to come back. So how could I sneak in to the next level of consciousness? If this, if I can learn from this story, how would I sneak into wherever I'm going or supposed to go? Uh, and how would I respond to who are you? profession, marital status, how many children, what I've done, what religion, none of those things. And I know that being a Southside Irish Catholic Democrat to start out with certainly would bar me. Uh, <laughs> so I certainly wouldn't tell him that. Um, so, what would I say? And I thought, I would try to get in with, I am a spirit who temporarily inhabited a person named Tom Lavin. I thought, there you go, that might do it. Now, if the voice bought that, then I'm sure that there would be some questions that would follow from that. And the questions I, I thought the voice would ask would be, after I said, I am a spirit who temporarily inhabited Tom Lavin, the voice might ask, did he ever become aware of the primal form or archetypal images of which he was an embodiment? different, weird. Was he ever conscious of his story? While you were with him, was he ever aware of his myth? And then I think the voice would ask, did his consciousness of his form ever get mattered in culture? It is consciousness of this archetypal image or primal form ever get mattered, make any difference in his environment? And those two questions scared the hell out of me and I stopped asking questions. <laughs> I thought, let the voice do whatever he, she, or it will when the time comes. I don't need to push the envelope anymore. 
Who are you? How do we look at ourselves? DeMello's point, I think, is, is well taken. He says, your duty is to be, not to be somebody, not to be nobody. For therein lies greed and ambition, not to be this or that, and thus become conditioned, but just to be. Interesting way of looking at it. Interesting way of walking around the mystery. How do we understand the question, who are you? The When it comes from our own depths, what type of response are we to give? And I, I believe that one of the major reasons for that, for mythology, is to begin to give images of meaning that we can relate to in terms of making our own myth matter. That form that we have, the primal form that we have. Now Jung talks about all of this stuff in Memories, Dreams, and Reflections. And I, uh, well, let me just tell you the story. Uh, in January of 1944, when Jung was 69 years old, he had a major heart attack. And uh, he was abed uh, from January until uh, about the 15th of April, 1944. And on the 4th of April, 1944, he had a vision. And his vision was that he was uh, out of himself. And he says, later I discovered how high in space one would have to be to have so extensive a view. So he is in space, and he's looking at a meteorite, and he sees in this big black meteorite an entrance, and he goes in, and there he sees a temple, in this tremendous dark block of stone. And to the right of the entrance, there is a Hindu yogin who is sitting silently in a lotus posture on a bench wearing a white gown. Jung knew he was expected. In another writing, Jung says that he was aware that the yogin was himself meditating on Carl Gustav Jung. And so he met in his near-death experience another aspect of himself. At the same time, he meets Dr. H, he calls them, I don't know what the man's name was, and Dr. H, he sees coming up to this level, high above the earth, who tells him that he has to go back. That there was too much protest on the earth regarding my going away. And that people said, I had no right to leave the earth and must return. Well, there are lots of jokes about that in Zurich in my day, <laughs> as to who was protesting and who wished he'd stayed wherever the hell he was. <laughs> um, but anyway, he says that the doctor was, he saw him in his primal form, point of the story, one of the points of the story. He saw the doctor in his pri primal form as a basileos of cloths. Basileos meaning king in Greek. And so he was a king of cloths, and you all remember that Kos was one of the major shrines, if not the major shrine, of Asclepius, the god of healing. And so his own doctor was a Basileus of Kos, who'd come up. He was an avatar of this Basileus. He was, says Jung, the temporal embodiment of the primal form 
which has existed from the beginning. And now, in this vision, he is appearing in that primal form. And this is on the 4th of April, 1944, and he says to himself, very disappointed, I thought, now I must return to the box system again. Back again. Not too happy about it. Um, in actual fact, Young was the last patient of this doctor, Dr. H., who on the 4th of April, 1944, took to his bed and died in a few days. He was a good doctor, writes Young. There was something of a genius about him. Otherwise, he would not have appeared to me as a prince of cause. So, sort of a synchronistic event at that particular time. What is my primal form? What is my story? What is my myth? What is the great story given to me to make matter in my culture, in my time? Some of you may have watched the... Channel 11, The Way West, for the last two nights. Um, The story of our massacre of the Lakota Sioux Indian. Not a happy thing to watch, but a necessary thing to watch. And towards the end last night, the story was told about Sitting Bull, who was more a holy man, more a shaman, than a warrior, brought in a shaman to teach and to renew his tribe with the myth and the ritual of the ghost dance. And what happened was that all of the Anglos saw the Sioux becoming energized as they were dancing and learning the ghost dance. The energy was palpable, and the Indian agent telegraphed to Washington, these people are becoming agitated, Uh, trouble is imminent, send as many troops as you can immediately. Myth and ritual are sometimes perceived as dangerous. Because myth and ritual, if done reverently and properly, bring energy from the depths into consciousness. And for a lot of people, that's a source of joy. And for a lot of people, it scares the hell out of them. And so, these people were scared, very scared. And their way of dealing with their fear was to massacre the Lakota Sioux at Wounded Knee. There's a wisdom there. If you take away the myth and the ritual, you destroy people. Or you destroy what you believe to be destructive in people who are inimical. And so, one of the early definitions of myth, probably the earliest from in Greek, mythos, is used by Herodotus, 4th century B.C. Uh, I think it was Cicero who called him the greatest of the, uh, the father of history. And uh, Herodotus defined myth following the tradition of of the Ionian philosophers um, to denote an essentially fictional account of the past and made a distinction between mythos and historia, the Greek word for inquiry, historia. 
And he says that Historia is a factual account of the past, whereas a myth, mythos, is essentially a fictional account of the past. And it was his hope that we, mythos, these stories would be displaced from human consciousness by the unvarnished truth about the past. Well, it didn't work. Even Aristotle, in his poetics, had problems with the historians. Uh, if you read the poetics, Aristotle feels that the uh, Herodotus and other Ionian philosophers uh, were too picky. They're caught up in particulars, days and dates. Remember all the things we had to do when we took history and put down on paper and you were right or wrong? Uh, just the names and the dates and the places. That's what history is. And Aristotle said, no, history is patterns. You've got to see patterns or you don't really understand the past. It's not just facts. Well, we have this problem, and I, I wonder, in, in thinking about myth, uh, I wonder if it isn't the fights about myth that go on yet today, uh, Jung uh, being mystical and mythical, and we don't want any of that. Freud saying to Jung, promise me, promise me, you'll move away from myths and the occult and, and get back into science. And, and Freud uh, was really trying to make a reputable place for the unconscious in medicine. But everyone was afraid that if we let this mythological way of thinking, magical thinking, Freud called it, uh, into medicine, it wouldn't be long before the clergy would take over again and we'd be back where we started. You see, with psychology as a part of rational philosophy. And so I think that there was a, a method in the fear. Well. There's something more here, I think, that is, is important. I think that there's a whole typological bias that we have to be aware of that, that we ourselves have been trained in, schooled in, formed in. And basically, our training, our academic training, has been a left brain training. If we would, let's say these are bug eyes here. So here's the left brain, and we'll quadrant the poor brain, and we'll say that this part is a thinking part, and this part is a sensation part, and then this part is an intuitive part, and this part down here is a feeling part. Basically, the thinking, if you want to think of this, pardon my back, but if you want to think of this in terms of four Fs, that the thinker, like Herodotus and the Ionian philosophers, wants the facts. Just the facts. That's what history is. That's what science is. That's what reality is. If we thought, what the hell is his name? Heraclitus of Miletus, the 5th century Ionian philosopher, if we can get the general principles, observe, get the facts, from the facts we'll get the general principles, and then we'll know how the world runs. Okay? And Herodotus was his disciple. Facts. Well, no, say other people, it's form. Facts aren't really important, it's the form you put it into. More Aristotelian in a way. Other people are really interested 
in things that are fantastic. And if it ain't fantastic, then why bother? And finally, the fourth F is feeling. And again, if if I can value, if this myth is going to give me a sense that I'm valuable in one way or another, and those commie bastards aren't, or somebody, some shadow scapegoat, we don't know who we're going to do this to today, um, if I'm more valued by this story and I feel more emotion from this story, well, then it's got to be true. And the job of mythology, then, is to gather people together to tell stories so that we know how valuable we are. And we're not interested in the days and the dates and the places and so on and so forth. And so I find this very interesting that there are a lot of people that have difficulty with mythology, myth, its role in life, if it's seen in another way or another part of the brain. So I think there's a there's a neurological basis for our biases. Uh, that we have have real difficulty if especially we're left brain people to open up to the fantastic or doing a lot of valuing. And the opposite is also true. Because myth is meant to ground us, to give us our ground back, to give us our sacred space back again, if we've lost it. And so each one of these particular geniuses is emphasized by different people in different ways. The mythologies have a right brain and a left brain bias. And you'll either love them or hate them. You'll find them false or you'll find them freeing, often depending on how myopic you are energetically. If you're, you're very rigid in your own typology, mythology could scare the hell out of you. Actually, Jung says that in, of all things, I found this quote that I hadn't seen, and I've read the book about three times, Essays on the Science of Mythology by Jung and Karenyi, which is in your bibliography. Jung gives a vision about four stones and fire around the stones and a person in the center. This is page 23. And he's interpreting this vision. And he says, the total personality is indicated by the four cardinal points, the four gods, i.e., the four functions which give bearings in psychic space. I love that. I'll say it again. The four functions which give bearings in psychic space. And so we need north, south, east, and west to get bearings in physical space. We need thinking, feeling, sensation, intuition to get our bearings in psychological space. Very good, Carl Gustav. And also by the circle enclosing the whole, overcoming the four gods who threaten to smother in the individual signifies liberation from identification with the four functions, followed by an approximation to the circle to undivided wholeness. This in turn leads to further exaltation. This is a footnote, by the way, on page 23. Um, the point of individuation is liberation from total identification with any one viewpoint or 
perspective or side of the brain. You know, individuation is finding that you have a corpus callosum, you know, something that puts the two halves together, and it works. It's a wonderful thing. And so just to be able to play with that, how do I view myth? When someone says myth, okay, am I looking at, like most of the dictionaries, the Oxford Dictionary, the American Dictionary, Webster's Dictionary, I looked at all three, and all of these talk about myth as a fictitious account the best one, though, is the Oxford Dictionary because it talked about a fictitious account of something supernatural. So that was brought in. Um, again, I think it's, it's just interesting how they, how they talk about it. I wouldn't say supernatural at all. Or only. I think that's fine. Again, many, many definitions. The, the Haggadah, the uh, ritual book for Passover that tells the stories. Okay. Uh, why do we celebrate this day? The Haggadah says that there are four ways to tell a proverb depending on the people to whom you're telling the proverb. There are many ways to tell a story. There are many ways to experience a myth. And so when we're dealing with something that is very important to us, like the story of the Passover, why do we tell the story of the Passover year after year after year? in Judeo-Christianity. Why is that story repeated? Why is the story repeated of Demeter and Persephone this time of year? Over and over, cyclically, throughout our lives, this time of year in May, we'll begin to see the many-colored fingernails of Persephone coming out of the ground, red and blue and yellow as she is let free again, let loose again from the underworld, and things begin to green again, because that's what Persephone does, and that's what resurrections mean, and that's what passing over is about into a new threshold, and that's what myths do. The developmental form of the myth helps us pass over whatever liminal space in our own development we need to pass through or pass over. This is a part of our lives. This myth, we were all in one way, or most of us in one way or another, educated in. This must, therefore, be a life lesson or a lesson about the life force. What mythology does is give us the images and the energy for those threshold times in our lives. I'm going to, I think it's important for you to hear a myth and not just talk about the theory of it. Um, it's important to hear a story told with enthusiasm and with belief. You know, there have been, we all, whatever culture anyone in this room comes from, we all come from wisdom circles. All of us, if we trace our backgrounds back far enough, we all come from places where people sat around a fire and they were told stories. And these stories gave them both energy and pointed the way. And that's, again, another Campbell definition. 
He says, mythology, a system of energy evoking and energy directing symbols which serve four functions for the culture and for the individual, the mystic, the cosmological, the sociological, and what we're talking about now, the threshold crossing function. When it's time to move, we get images. When we stop moving, we're soul dead. We're dead. That's when someone asks, the voice asks the question, who are you? When movement stops. When we don't breathe anymore. And so we're all descendants of people who were enlightened by stories around the fire. We've lost that. We've lost that. So we can go back maybe to Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts or that camping trip. But it's something extraordinary. It's not part of our lives. We're not warned. We're not fired up by myths anymore. I'm going to show you a small part of the film. The film... Uh, is called Into the West. And it's a story about two traveler boys, tinker boys, they used to call them tinkers. That's not politically correct anymore. You have to say traveler, traveling people. And Ireland, the government in Ireland, decided that these people were a disgrace. I mean, they didn't even speak Gaelic. They spoke their own language fancy that. And they, they're just terrible, dirty people going around in caravans and so on. And so they decided that the best thing would be uh, would be to put them uh, into housing and educate these people who had been traveling all their lives. And they did. And if you go to uh, the north part of Dublin today, you will see uh, what you're going to see in the film. Uh, tenements with travelers uh, who have always been on the road and now are stuck in high-rises. Uh, and so the story begins that the grandfather of these two boys who have lost their mother comes in to North Dublin with his caravan and with a strange white horse and uh I'll play, and then he tells, the grandfather tells the story. And so I'll play this for you. It won't take that long. Uh, what it's going to point out, I think, is the need that we all have for myths. To energize us on our journey. Remember, the, tonight we're supposed to talk about journeys and pilgrimages. Uh, and we are. But myth as a way of understanding the journeys and the pilgrimages that we take. That before we make our journeys and pilgrimages, we need images that are alive so that we will go as sort of heat-seeking missiles, as meaning-seeking persons. There's a, a, a tremendous difference between taking a trip taking a quest and making a pilgrimage. You know, it's, just, it's unbelievable uh, seeing people. And in Europe, I used to avoid people with $5 a day. That dates me, though, doesn't it? <laughs> but I'd see people with $5 a day in Zurich, you know, kind of, oh, Jesus, look at that. How much is that? Oh, you know, and so on. Uh, they were taking trips. Okay. Um, you need to make, and I need to make, quests if we are to be able to answer the judgmental voice, if indeed there might be one. Uh, and so let's look at this. This is the story, the story of 
that really, you, I'm going to tell you, most of Irish mythology, Celtic mythology, is based on the story of the journey or the voyage of Prince Brian. This story that he tells is a bit of the story, and it'll remind you of stories that you know from whatever ethnic background you come from, this story has these elements. So enough of that. We'll just play it. And when, as Jung said to, to Bill Wilson, when a people have lost their spirit, they go to spirits. And so you see that uh, in the film. Uh it's a wonderful film. It is rentable at Blockbuster or wherever. Um, and therefore, the need of myths to rekindle the spirit. Therefore, the need of stories to rekindle the spirit so that people don't... I mean, that's the whole... Uh, one of the major geniuses of... 12-step movements, if they don't lose it. Some do, some don't. Uh, and that is the ability to tell stories again. The stories of, uh, well, stories in a circle where there are no uh, interpreters, analysts, um, those who know better, you know, and all that. Uh, where there is no power hierarchy, and people share stories. People tell stories of the presence of the extraordinary in the ordinary. And that's the genius of 12-step groups. But we've had this. It's, I mean, it's 12-step groups, Bill Wilson and Bob Smith, and others didn't invent this. This is indigenous to all of our stories. That there were circles of fire around which people, circles of wisdom, and people sold, told stories of the intra-natural and supernatural for millennia. In other words, it's, it's not just the story of the divine above, which is very important. We also have to talk about uh, Tirnanog, which is under the water, and other stories about the divine in the earth. Because if you don't, then there is uh, if everything good is up in God, then everything down is bad in the devil. Superior, inferior. And so we need to realize that there are as many myths about going down into the deeper, darker, dearer divine, like the myth of Anana finding her sister a Reshkigal, is there are journey stories of climbing mountains and hills and um, resurrections and ascensions so that there, there has to be in our storytelling uh, a balancing of above and below and right and left. A wholeness an inclusiveness, an inclusive mythology where differences are celebrated. Uh, I was giving a lecture to a bunch of theologians yesterday and this woman said, well, how can I be a feminist theologian and an extrovert at the same time? Is that, is that politically incorrect? Um, and I said, it couldn't possibly be. She said, you know, as a feminist theologian, I'm to go down deeper into more familiar, intimate ground. 
uh, but I'm an extrovert and I have a tendency to go out instead of in. And my suggestion to her was that it, it wasn't politically incorrect at all, uh, that she could gather stories about ingoing and indwelling uh, and really put them together uh, into a mythology of inner journeys as an only a wonderful extroverted thinker could do. And uh, as Jean Boland, for instance, did uh, in Goddesses in Every Woman. Uh, and so there is no uh, energy pathway uh, or side of the brain or gender uh, or ethnic or color or there is nothing in the universe that does not celebrate and join in the dance of differences. It's very important in our culture to understand when they're wacko in Waco <laughs> and in Oklahoma City and other places in the world, but let's own our own. You know, and I think it's, it's very important to understand that if we don't journey, if we don't go for it internally or externally, if we don't get missed, we're going to go crazy. We need this grounding. Society needs it. You know, I mentioned in um, the brochure that I wrote for this course, but also uh, mentioned uh, earlier about Campbell and his definitions of mythology. And he says there are four functions of mythology. The myth mystical, the cosmological, the sociological, and the developmental or psychological function. So mythological, cosmological, sociological function, and developmental. Sociological for a second, people need to know where, they're, where they come from. They need story containers. And if you do away with story containers, then you're opening yourself, your culture, your family, your subculture to chaos. And I think that if things go well in a culture, these four aspects of myth are in harmony with one another. If a culture is chaotic, then the mystical and the cosmological and the sociological and the psychological are not in sync. They're like the horses in Plato's Canyon going in all different directions. This happens to an individual and we say that she or he is psychologically sick when they when they really are not journeying on the path. Now, we don't have a sense of Tao in the West as they do in the East. And the word Tao means path or way. And remember that, that the early first century Christians were called followers of the way. They weren't called. The first name for this group was followers of the way, Taoists, so to speak. People who followed a way, people who saw in their stories a way in which they could live compassionately with one another. And so there is a whole sociological function of myth. In the story that you just saw, the boys then take the horse 
into the West. And they're chased by police and so on. It's a wonderful allegory of what happens when someone follows her or his own intuitive understanding. And Jung tells us in volume five of the Collected Works uh, that the horse is indeed a symbol, a familiar of the Great Mother, and is really very much caught up with the instinct of intuitive understanding. And so when we have and follow or ride our own intuitive understandings, very often we get the law uh, against us. We have difficulties. Um, and so there is a sociological function that is very important. We can't say that it's just the mystical function. We don't just journey and take our journeys only because we need the experience or the awakening of a sense of awe. We do. But that awfulness has a cultural dimension to it. Our culture needs to feel awe. If it doesn't, then, as Timothy McVeigh said, something big is going to happen. Something big happens. Jung says this in volume 18 in his monograph on the symbolic life. And I'll bring the direct quote in for you next week. We all need to be missed. We all need to see ourselves as part of a big story. When we're alienated, when we're ostracized from the story of our culture, or if the story of our culture is ostracized, from the story of the cosmos, then we have chaos, then we have violence. I found it very interesting, and maybe some of you saw this too, in Newsweek, uh, this past week, May 8th issue, on page 52, uh, they have a story, and I'll hold it up, it says, Tales from the Myth file and it's all about the death of Hitler talk about use of the word myth that the authors of a book to be published this month in May entitled The Death of Hitler by Ada Petrova and Peter Watson uh, they found in the archives in Moscow last year file called Operation Myth. And in that file was the skull of Adolf Hitler, as far as they know, which they dug up in Magdeburg, Germany, uh, in 1970. And um, the name of the file about the last days of Hitler was called Operation Myth and its subtitle was Hitler and His Entourage. It's another use of the word myth. Um, in other words, I think there's, there's a whole candy ass approach to uh, mythology um, that doesn't help us either so that we get the mystical, wonderful dancing bear or uh, the totem animal of your choice, and then everything will be fine. Uh, that's not true either. Nature is nature, not good, not bad. It's nature. A wonderful journeying story that, that brings this up is a story that the Navajos tell about... Uh, Badger, who is sort of uh, every person. And Badger uh, was called to go to the place in New Mexico, I forget the name of the mountain now, where people go and then they're sort of beamed up uh, to the other world and they uh, get whatever teachings 
they get and then they come down and usually then this person is a shaman and she or he shares this with members of the tribe. So Badger was called, was beamed up by the great spirit and was up there for seven years and came down with all of these wonderful truths and was the next day to go uh, and to tell everyone uh, the new order of things. And so he went to his Hogan, but as he went to his Hogan, he heard screaming and crying of his children. And he peeked in the side, and his children were horribly malnourished and beaten. His wife was malnourished and beaten. And they were screaming, and they were fearful that Coyote would be back soon and beat them again. And Badger had left his wife and children in the care of Coyote, his friend Coyote. And so as soon as he saw Coyote, he lunged upon him, killed him, uh, and went the next day to the tribal meeting place to give the new wisdom. And when he got there, he saw Coyote in the midst of the members of the tribe. There is Coyote. And he runs back to the mountain and screams up and says, I killed Coyote last night. Why is he alive again? And the voice said, we know. And we know Coyote was wrong and we know you killed him. But you see, on earth you need a Coyote. That's the way things are. So we had to breathe life back into it. And that was one of the teachings that he had to give to the people in the tribe. These stories tell us uh, really about the uh, geography of our own souls. You and I will always have our coyote. There is no ritual. There is no myth. There is no action or reaction that will take away the coyote from our heart. Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen where we are in the here and now. And so we have situations where if I don't own my own coyote, if I don't own my own daimon, then of course I project it onto other people and then people get hurt. And of course, says Time Magazine, May 1st, lastly, there's a religious component to the hard-bitten right. Dan Fuller, a retired crop duster who last year joined the Christian Covenant community in Idaho, glimpses signs of the mark of the beast from the Book of Revelation in the government fiscal policy, etc., 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 the Babylonian federal government. I think Victor White said this very well in 1947 after he visited Auschwitz. And you'll find this in his book, God and the Unconscious. He said, we've done away with stories of hell so we had to make one here on earth. What happens when a culture is mythless? We don't believe in heaven. We don't believe in hell. We don't believe in goddesses. We don't believe in gods. There is no affirmation from above or below. There is no rejection from above or below. And if you're to use the Mediterranean Basin theory, there is no reconciliation from above or below, or the restoration. Judaism, Islam, Christianity, Zoroastrianism, all are restorational. There was a fall. And one has to restore 
the harmony that once was in the Garden of Eden. But then, of course, myths get told and there are sub-myths and then you hear it that it's only our group who has the book and the word and only we will be restored. And only this branch in Waco will be restored when the time comes and it may be tomorrow. What happens if we don't in our culture have a myth that holds us together, that gives us our spirit back if we've lost it, or that points the way west, that tells us that we can have, should have, must have an adventure? Jung said in 1932 in a monograph, a paper he gave to Alsatian ministers in Strasbourg. Uh, and it's in volume 11 of the Collected Works and it's called Psychotherapists or the Clergy. And in that monograph he says, people are waiting for war. Everything is so banal. Nothing is happening. People say, let's have a war. So something will happen. Something exciting will happen to us. Something mythological. Something that has a mythic dimension to it will happen again. He didn't say those exact words, mythic dimension to it. I'm saying that. And so we can get so caught up in the ordinary that we manufacture something extraordinary in order to feel part of a myth larger than ourselves. And so all of us need a harmonious functioning of myth in our lives. The mystical does what? It awakens and maintains a sense of awe and mystery of being and that we have a participation in that mystery. What Claude Levi-Strauss called participatio mystique. And that there is, that we feel that we have, that we are participating in a story much bigger than the story of our own egos. Another thing that Claude Levi-Strauss said, I found in my research that I thought was very interesting. He says, anytime someone is telling a myth, we know it right away. We're aware of it. How do you know when a myth takes place? I watched some of your faces when the boy touched the mouth of the horse. Everybody in this room knew something different was happening. There was some sort of participation mystique between the boy and the horse. Something bigger than the boy and the horse happened. And in the very beginning, the father, who was the king of the travelers, and therefore horsemen, comes up to the horse, the horse moves away, and the grandfather in the carriage says, Ah, you've lost your gift, Papa. You're not in harmony with your own instincts. You're not in harmony with your intuitive understanding or the horse would come to you. The horse comes to the boy or the girl in all of us. If we haven't lost our spirit. And so 
this participation mystique. We know it. Claude Levi Strauss says, you know it, you know there is a myth right away. Everyone knows that a story that snakes talking, that a relationship between an animal and pollen boy in the Navajo culture, that there is this instinctual bonding that is alive. And it's more than a story. These myths are soul food. We need these myths. Why else would Sitting Bull call in another shaman from another tribe to do the ghost dance again? To prepare people for their journey. And that's actually what happened, although they were massacred on the way. We share and tell stories listen to stories of the extraordinary in the ordinary. We do the dance. And by dancing, we give witness to the energy in the story. That's what the the ghost dance is about. That's what our dancing is about. We've lost contact with that, too, as part of our culture. And all of the older rituals If you read the Hebrew Bible, if you read the Christian, well, if you read the Gospel of Thomas, the Gnostic Gospel, there is dancing, is part of the ritual we've forgotten how to dance. We've left our bodies at the door or on the stairs before we go into the synagogue or into the church or into the mosque. There is a whole mythological, archetypal, bodily dimension. You know, well, it's it's all that right brain intuitive stuff. No! Your body reacts and my body reacts to stories. Your body reacts and my body reacts to circles of fire. We react to sharing among equals stories of um, of the extraordinary and the ordinary. Have you ever been with someone who died? Have you ever accompanied a person with AIDS into death? Or with cancer into death? Are there stories that you could tell about that? about the presence of the extraordinary in the ordinary? I think that our culture is on the verge of being re-mythologized. But I don't think this time it's going to happen, again, this is just my opinion, I don't think it's going to happen in a church or a big church or a big movement. I think Csikszent Mahai is correct at the end of his book, The Evolving Self, when he says, small cells of people sharing stories is where it's going to happen in the third millennium. And I believe he's right. The idea of equals sharing telling and receiving, giving witness to the presence of the mythical layers of our existence. There are these levels. These are the life-giving levels in our existence. They bring the spirit back to us. And so you have people like Charles Garfield out in California, who works with people who are dying of AIDS and has for years. And Garfield is an interesting guy. He is a clinical psychologist who wrote his dissertation on peak performance. And what he did was to study people uh, who won 
uh, silver or gold medals at the Olympics in California in 84. And his research basically says, and I'm oversimplifying it, I'm sorry, but what it says is those who got the medals had images of winning, of making it over the pole, or touching the end of the swimming pool and winning the gold. It wasn't just training and exercise and discipline and tenacity and fortuitousness and all of that, but rather the image transformed their own bodies. There was a whole mystique about what they did. The guy that, that did uh, peak performance, Charles Garfield, also started a hospice for people with AIDS, and he developed at the same time what he called wisdom circles for people who deal with AIDS, people who have AIDS, so that people could come together and tell stories of what happened during the death and dying process. I think that there are wisdom circles uh, that are going to be more, everything starts in California and gets to Chicago, you know, 10 years later, that's all right. Just have to put up with that, what else? But I do think that there are wisdom circles that are forming, people who are becoming more conscious of the fact that they do have their own myth, they do have their own story, they are part of a big story. There is a yearning and a hunger to appreciate the extraordinary in the ordinary, um, we're not as easy, I think, as a culture to toss away the word myth. That's a myth, which means that's a lie. Well, that's a myth. And certainly it's not politically correct anymore to talk about old wise tales. <laughs> as a way of dismissing a dimension of reality. Uh, and yet, that, those were the words that were used. I think that these familiar tales, because these tales are part of our family, uh, still retain their magic and their magnetic power to enchant us. It's interesting in terms of mythology in our century, and then I'm going to open this up for questions. Um, there are two myths that are popularized in our century. Uh, they're popularized at the same time, at the beginning of, of this century. And one is a myth about a boy and his mother, and that's the Oedipal myth. And there's another myth, and that's about a boy seeking his father, who is journeying from place to place, and that, of course, is the Odysseus myth. A whole psychology has been built around the repression of drive. A whole psychology that says, who are you? Say, well, I am the current incarnation of Electra or Oedipus. That's what my spirit is in. That's how I'm defined. Oh, really? And another says, no, uh, I am the current incarnation of the myth of Odysseus. 
And there I am, here in Dublin, in June. And I'm a regular Odysseus, I am. My name is Bloom. My name is Daedalus. My name is Buck Mulligan. But I'm a part of this story. What groups, what does that tell you about people living in a Jewish ghetto in Austria at the turn of this century? What does the myth tell you about people living in this island, the far west of Europe, at the beginning of this century? I find that fascinating and how this determines how people think about themselves or don't think about themselves or feel or intuit or sense. And so these stories we find, uh, all of you probably somewhere in college were, were exposed to Bullfinch and Bullfinch's mythology, Thomas Bullfinch, who says, look, if you look at major art masterpieces, literature, the great timeless stories of humankind. If you don't know mythology, how could you appreciate these things? You don't, or you can't. Uh, and I think he's right. His exact quote from Bullfinch is that a knowledge and appreciation is essential for the appreciation of the world's greatest art, literature, and cultural heritage. Without a knowledge of mythology, much of the meaning of the world's great poems, artistic masterpieces, and timeless literature is lost. To be rootless, end of Bullfinch, uh, to be rootless is to have no relationship with and not be grounded in the meaning-making images which has been forged in the smithy of the human soul. To be rootless. And I'm taking that wonderful phrase from Joyce. In Portrait of an Artist as a Young Man, Joyce says, Stephen Dedalus left Ireland to forge in the smithy of his soul the uncreated conscience of his race. We are all forging in the smithy of our own souls a new dimension of the conscious and consciousness of our race. I think this is the cultural significance of analytical psychology. Our culture has a dream, and the dreams of culture are called myths. As the dream is to the individual person, the myth is to the culture. It's a message from the other world. It's like, it's like the heart, you know? The heart is the place where the, in, in the human being, where the human and the divine come together. Something is so brutal or so beautiful that we say, it can break your heart. And this is the domain of mythology. In some cases, we look at our culture and we look at the divisions, we look at the Grand Canyon in our culture between the haves and the have-nots, the rights and the lefts, the blacks and the whites. And we know that we're dealing with mythology on a grand scale. We're acting it out on a grand scale. Back to Claude Levi-Strauss again, who says, mythology is the resolution of binary opposites. Every myth has its opposites. Every myth has its tragic or comic 
solution or solutions. Is life for you and me a continual process of coming to terms through images with the opposites within us? Is the life and death of a culture either the yea-saying to myth or the nay-saying to myth? <clears throat> saying yes to the images that give our vehicles of meaning and energizing us to begin again, to journey again, to travel again, to take the leap again, whether that be in adolescence or midlife or the final crossing the final threshold. That's what myths are about. In order to be like our man in the, in the film, in order to be um, a Shanaki or a storyteller, in Ireland you had to pass uh, oral examination. And basically what you had to do was to tell the 12 great stories and then you had to tell the 12 variations of each of the 12 stories. And if you missed a word, then you had to come back next year for the examinations. So six hours of memory were demanded to be considered a Shanaki someone who held within his heart the culture-changing stories and went from town to town telling them. Now the story, one of those persons, actually one Shanaki, uh, who died in 1930, uh, but was educated, uh, Patrick Cullum, and Patrick Cullen was a, an Irish storyteller, but translator as well. And he tells in a book, a collection called Orpheus, Myths of the World, he tells stories from all cultures. But the, the story that he tells, the, the basic journeying story for the Celtic people in Ireland is the voyage of Brian to the land of the immortals. And in this story, Brian had, who was a prince, had everything closed. The harvest was in. No one, the ramparts were closed. No one could enter anymore. And he was feasting the notables and nobility, as it's put. It's, this is a direct translation from the Gaelic, so some of the language is, um, doesn't flow um, as well as it could had ever seen. Her garb was strange. She wore a garb that no woman in this part of the country ever wore before. And there was a fragrance that came from a branch she held that perfumed the whole hall. And she sang, and her song was enchanting, and the song was that they should all come to Eam, all come to this place, there's such a marvel, treason and wounding are gone, and the sorrow of parting does not exist. Who comes to this island, hears in the dawn the birds, and shall know all delight through all the ages? It is the island of eternal youth, it is the island of Tirnanog. And Brian uh, thinks it's a, an enchanting song, but drops it. The next day he leaves the castle and there's music around him at all times. The music, the song, never leaves him. That night he goes to bed, he has a dream, and it's the same moment again. And she says, you must come to the island. This is where you belong. And so he goes, he takes in, there's a whole Irish thing of fosterage, and so he takes nine people, each with a foster brother of his, and they go to the island, 
And finally, they, uh, one of the persons says, I want to come back. This is Ushin. I want to come back. And the queen says, no, you can't go back because if you go back, you're very old and you'll die. And the variation on this story is, they can go back, but they can't leave the boat. Once they leave the boat, Okay, does this sound like Shangri-La to anyone here who's <laughs> been through high school English and so on? You, that's what, don't leave the special place. And yet, they do, and they come back, and he, they stand on the shore, they may not leave the boat, and they say, uh, or uh, Brian says, here I am. And I'm the king here. And they said, we had a king ages and ages ago. People talk about him. But that was long ago, and we have a new king now. And there's a new place now. And one of his uh, foster brothers decides to jump ship and come swims ashore and disintegrates in front of the people. Because once you've been to Tirnano, you may never return. To me, this, this whole story of moving from a safe, secure place where the ramparts are closed, the drawbridge is drawn up, we are comfortable in our Judeo-Christian myth or our Buddhist myth or our Hindu myth or our Taoist myth and into our plentiful gathering of notables and nobles comes the presence of the soul who invites us in our adolescence, in our midlife, in our old age to come to the new place. Those of us who don't listen to her or him have what they call in psychology a big fucking Neurosis. <laughs> well, neurosis anyway. Not to move to the next stage. Not to hear the call. Not to hear the music. Clinically is known as a neurotic condition. How do I then leave the fortress, leave the castle, leave the marsupial pouch as a good kangaroo of creed, code, and cult that I was raised in and move out to Tirnano. We do that, I would suggest, through myth. In succeeding weeks, we're going to talk about Myths of sacrifice and bliss, heroes and heroines, these moving stories, and then finally, uh, mythologies of love and marriage. How do we understand all of these? These are the 12 stories. These are the main ones. All our lives, you and I, and the life of our culture are variations of the great story where the human and the divine meet. At least, that's my opinion right now. Uh, I'm open for about five minutes of questions. Yes, sir. It's alive for me, of course. You know, and I think uh, there is a way uh, for all of us. And I think the question is excellently taken. The... the one can also become very neurotic trying to walk someone else's path. So I went to this shaman conference, you know, and I saw this guy with a big bandana and the shirt and the drum and, you know, a little sage hanging out of his pocket, you know. And I said, I know your name's O'Brien. What the fuck are you doing here? No, I didn't. 
Um, Because his name was really Riley. (laughs) But you know, it's foolish in a certain way, and we all uh, have permission to make ethnic fools out of ourselves. Why not? Uh, But it would be much better to really know the blood that's in my own bones, and if I have a lot of different blood in my own bones, um, I might even need to get more in touch with the Native American blood. I mean, not undoing the story I just told, uh, and really understand the land of the turtle in which I was born, because I'm no one ethnic group other than a mix of Western European. But whatever resonates in my heart, whatever stories resonate in my heart, I don't have to be um, of this particular ethnic group to get in touch with the magic. I'll know, my heart will know. I'll hear the stories. And it's, it's helpful if I go into my own mythology, but it's not necessary. There's a, a wonderful story that, that DeMello tells of someone who is in a language lab and uh, goes up to the desk and says, may I have a blank tape, please? And the person says, what, uh, what language are you studying? And, and the student says, French. And she says, well, I'm sorry, we don't have any blank tapes in French. And he says, well, do you have any blank tapes in English? And she says, yes, I'll do. And he says, fine, give me one of those. (laughs) It makes as much sense, says DeMello, to speak of a blank tape being French or English as it does to speak of a person being French or English or French or, or, or French or English are conditionings of the myth. They're not you. They're colorings on the story. They're fall or spring or winter or summer takes on the cycle. And so it really doesn't make any difference what ethnic story touches your soul. It just means that you have to have the presence of mind to know when your heart's a flutter. That's the main thing. That's the main thing. That does it. I'm touched in the place where the head and the heart meet, that Archimedean point that we call soul. Ah! We say, we have an aha experience. Okay? If you're in awe, you're in the right place. No matter whose story it is. That would be my suggestion. Yes. Yep. And if you fall off the horse, you're not going to disintegrate. Or if you don't go to Mass every Sunday, you won't disintegrate. And if you don't spin them prayer wheels as you're going by the Lama's house, you won't disintegrate. Disintegration is a myth. (laughs) Yes. Good. I I think it's a good point. One of, for instance, one of the books on my original bibliography um, was the feminine heroine in American and British literature by Carol S. Pearson. And I got a call from the Institute, uh, Carol Pearson, who did Awakening the Hero Within and um, other things. And they said, we checked books in print uh, to make sure that people could order this book by Carol Pearson. It's been out of print for quite a few years. Um, 
I think the whole question of circles of wisdom, when books like this, stories like this, uh, why do people teach uh, only certain books in mythology and not others? Why are there uh, all sorts of people um, who will praise one set of literature that is not inclusive? Uh, and so I think in our circles of wisdom, one of the major tenets has to be that we tell stories that are inclusive, that when someone gets the talking stick as it's passed around the fire, we will be sensitive enough to tell stories that differ ethnically, uh, differ in gender, differ in terms of religious persuasion, etc., so that we're sensitive to each other's prison way of perceiving the wonder and awesomeness of myth. And I think it's very well taken. And you know, more things like this need to be done. Yes, please. There is a, a, a space of trying to fill up that void with a lot of, of prejudice. Not only her work, but uh, too, uh, but also the company that she started sounds true, where she has women and men telling stories and dancing around uh, the, the wisdom of myth. Uh, so that she's done a, a tremendous job, I think, in this regard. Uh, not just women who run with the wolves, but also the she is actively promoting uh, the myth-making function in all of us. And that's wonderful. That's great. Thank you so much for coming this evening. And uh, if you can, see you next week and next week and next week. This podcast is distributed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Share it all you like as long as you maintain the attribution to the speaker, but please do not change it or sell it. If you like this episode, tell your friends about us or leave us a review on iTunes. For more information about classes, training programs, videos, audio, this podcast, or to find a Jungian analyst near you, visit our website, www.jungchicago.org.